Um, thank you very much, Minister Skinner. That was um, yeah, most helpful. Um, so I'd now um, like you to welcome um, Professor um, Stephen Rabinovich, who I've already introduced before um, from Canada to, to give today's um, keynote address. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cathy, and, and, and thanks uh, very much. It's, it's really uh, an honour uh, for me to be here. Um, I've regarded Australia and New Zealand as, as leaders for many years in the area of, of mobility and fall prevention in older adults, so that uh, makes this um, especially meaningful for me. Uh, I'd like to thank Terry and the um, organizing committee for, for the invitation. So let me just start by um, mentioning that a lot of the, what I'm going to present today um, are, are results from a large observational study that involves video capture uh, of real life falls. And, and just to clarify that all videos, all, all people who are shown in videos and images have, have given us their consent to use those materials for educational purposes. Now, this slide shows numbers for Canada, and I was thinking, oh, I wonder what the, the numbers for Australia are. Um, so I did a little bit of research and, and found it's, it's really not so different. Uh, Canada and uh, Australia, and I apologize, uh, I don't know exactly the numbers in, in New Zealand, but um, Canada and Australia are quite similar, I think, in population. And, and here you see that we have about 23,000 annual hip fractures in Canada with costs of about a billion dollars uh, for medical treatment. 90%, uh, 95% of those hip fractures are due to falls and um, obviously it's a very serious injury because 25% of people will die within one year and 50% will, will have a major loss in, uh, in independence. The, the other injuries that I mentioned here are, are head injuries and, and wrist fractures. And, and wrist fractures are, are as common as, as hip fractures, but, but people don't die uh, of wrist fractures, very rarely anyway. Uh, but head injuries, I think we're having a growing recognition uh, about the importance of that, and, and I'll mention that. So I'll start by listing, uh, I think it's four challenges that sort of summarize some of the rationale behind the work uh, that we're doing. And, and, and the first is that it's, as, as, and much of this is, you know, sort of, you know, um, with well known to you, but uh, the first is that falls are very difficult to, pre to prevent uh, because there's a long list of risk factors and individuals who present with falls often have multiple uh, co coexisting risk factors. So, and again, you're, you're well aware of, of uh, many of these that I list. So that's the first challenge. It's hard to prevent falls, especially when we want to promote mobility in, in frailer populations. We've traditionally been very interested in preventing injuries associated with falls, and, and hip fracture is, is probably the one that I've worked you know, the longest on. And the challenge that I list here has to do with the fact that um, it's not just risk for falls, but also bone strength and this sort of interaction. So. Uh, that's been a very, you know, that, that's a challenge. And, and, you know, I was interested to hear Terry mention that, you know, musculoskeletal people are working with falls people, but I think you'll agree with me that traditionally these fields of sort of wanting to sort of claim ownership of, you know, that, that hip fracture is a problem of osteopor osteoporosis or no hip fracture is a problem of, of, um, of, of, of balance and falls. As we know, it's both. Um, but we can't prevent hip fractures just through osteoporosis medications because falls are a big part of it. And you see here that um, the, you know, the risk factor for hip fracture, uh, the risk for hip fracture in the event of a fall is increased you know, six-fold if you fall sideways and 30-fold if you impact your hip. But things like lower limb weakness and um, upper limb weakness, which may affect your ability to you know, absorb energy with your arms and so on, those are nearly or more important than uh, bone mineral density in determining fracture risk. The third challenge goes back to what I mentioned before of, of this growing recognition and, and seeing that, that the numbers themselves are growing in terms of head injuries associated with falls. 
And um, I apologize, the, 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 these, these um, graphs are very hard to see, but on the left side are some data from Finland, um, from Pekka Canis's group, showing, who showed a threefold increase in the age-adjusted rate of traumatic brain injury due to falls in individuals aged 80 and older. Uh, a threefold increase over about 30 years. The data on the right side are from uh, Jackie Close and her group, uh, who, you know, with Australia data, showed about a threefold increase in um, subdural hemorrhage over a 10 year period. So, what's going on here? Maybe we're counting these uh, injuries in a better way, but um, we strongly suspect it has to do with increased anticoagulant use. So um, while hip fractures are sort of leveling in terms of age-adjusted incidence, we see this rapid increase that again may be due to, to anticoagulant use. Now the challenge, the last challenge I, I list and the one I think that we've worked, our group has, has worked, um, you know, most specifically to try and address is this lack of understanding of, of sort of the cause of falls and how and why falls occur. Um, that, that few studies have recorded body movements during real life falls. We've done, and others have done some studies in the lab where young people fall on gym mats and we've tried to develop sort of creative ways to do that. But really we know that, you know, there's major questions about the external validity of the data from those studies in terms of describing what falls in older adults might be like. Um, we, you know, I'll present a little bit of data that's looking at you know, the accuracy of incident reports, and, um, but, but, but we know that falls are a difficult thing to recall and describe. So um, the data that we have, which largely relies on those sort of incident reports uh, or, or self-descriptions, uh, in a sense is questionable. So, so uh, we need better data to inform interventions, better data on how falls actually occur, and, and to link that sort of observational uh, data that, that I'll describe today with clinical and um, situational and, and environmental factors. So for a long time now, uh, since uh, 2007, we have um, had a, a research partnership with two long-term care facilities in the Fraser Health region of British Columbia, where we have networks of digital video cameras in common areas. So we're talking about hallways, uh, dining rooms, lounges, no bedrooms or bathrooms, but collectively we have 270 cameras. And um, over a seven year period, we have now collected and analyzed uh, 1,168 falls in 368 residents. We've developed techniques to analyze the falls where a team of experts completes a structured questionnaire that has been validated. And there, there are cohorts within this group, including uh, a group of uh, 108 fallers that's grown, but I'll show you some data of 108 fallers who have given us permission to access uh, the medical records. There's also a group, of course, that have provided us with um, consent to use um, their images and videos, et cetera, for educational purposes, as I mentioned. So this table shows the population that we're talking about. It's about 60% female. Um, over one half of individuals, so, so now all of the individuals here have fallen at least once, otherwise they're, they're not in our database. But over half of them have fallen at least twice. Um, you can see that 60% um, have dementia. And that really follows, and these demographics in a sense follow what is typical for British Columbia in long-term care. Uh, you can see uh, that 43% have hypertension, many of them are on antihypertensive medications, and about 40% are on, are on one or more of an antipsychotic, antidepressant, or an analgesic. So medications that we know are associated with risk for falls. You can see about 35% have some sort of visual impairment. Now looking at the injuries that have occurred from the, the falls that we have analyzed, 47% um, uh, of injuries are to the head. 20% like of falls 
overall result in some form of injury, and 47% of those injuries are to the head. Uh, you can see that most of those head injuries are cuts, scrapes, abrasions, um, some swelling. Rarely do we see diagnosed concussion. And we can come back to that. I think that's a di that, that has to do with the difficulty in diagnosing concussion. But you'll see some falls where you, you know, you'll be wondering how did that not result in some sort of um, cognitive uh, effect, concussion, or worse. Um, we have six hip fractures. We have zero wrist fractures. Now, I mentioned that we have this um, structured questionnaire that we use to analyze the falls. And um, here you see that we divide the, the falls into three stages, the initiation, uh, the descent, and the impact stage. And here you see some of the factors that we're interested in with each of those stages. And I'll start by describing some results related to initiation of the fall, the, the cause of imbalance. We like, don't like to use the word cause of the fall, which is, of course, a very loaded term. I mean, there's the clinical cause of the fall, there's the environmental. We're, so, so in a sense, we're, we're, we're looking at what was the, the perceived cause of imbalance there, like trip, slip, et cetera. Uh, what was the activity at the time of the fall? Uh, and then with regard to impact, you see that you know, we're interested in did the head impact. Um, between these two, descent and, and impact, we're interested in the direction of the fall, et cetera. So, so the, the um, this questionnaire has been validated for internal consistency, and you can see the reference there. You can download the entire questionnaire along with the instruction booklet. We're actually very curious about what others think of, of this approach. Now, getting to um, the results. So, so what I've shown here is sort of a cluster plot um, where on the horizontal is cause of imbalance, on the vertical is activity at the time of the fall, and each fall that, you know, goes into each of those categories as a dot. And here I've just highlighted uh, the, the largest groups. So by far you can see that um, incorrect weight shifting was the largest cause category for cause of imbalance. And that occurred during transferring, walking, and standing. It was common in all three of those activities. Loss of support was the second most common. And trip was common. And trip was, was mostly related, of course, to walking. Now, I'm going to show you, so, so this is a total of 351 falls, 148 fallers. I'm going to show you the same data, exact same data, but just in different format that I'm going to use to present some other data. So this is this so-called mosaic plot, where the size of the box indicates you know, how common, like what portion overall was due to that combination of cause of imbalance and activity at the time of the fall. So again, incorrect weight shifting, 44% in total, common in all three, where you see you know, loss of support was the next most common trip. Um, and trip, of course, was, was primarily uh, due to walk, you know, occurred during walking and so on. Interestingly, slips, based on our analysis, were very rare in this environment. Less than 2% of falls were due to slips. Now, what about attempts to recover balance? We saw that those were common, that nearly one half of falls, we observed one or more steps after the perceived instant of imbalance, one or more steps made in an attempt to recover balance. In all cases, they, these, these weren't successful because, again, we're only analyzing falls. We haven't analyzed near falls. That's something we want to do. But uh, again, so these were unsuccessful, but, but we see the attempt made. And in 25% of cases, we see an attempt to reach to grasp. And that was actually more common. Like if you, ha if you executed a step, you were more, more likely to, to, to also execute a grasping response. So we see that there's, in general, an intactness of these kind of responses. Now, if we look at subcategories, and, and finally, I'll, I'll start showing you some videos here, but um, if we look at, um, again, these were the two largest causes of imbalance, and the percent number that I show here is a percent of all falls that we've analyzed. So 15% of all falls, the, the cause of imbalance was excessive trunk sway as a subcategory of incorrect weight shifting. Just as common was loss of support with the moving object, and then over here, you see 10% failure to establish 
and external support during transferring. So let's look at this video, um, which is excessive trunk sway. So you see she's sort of staggering, she has unstable um, balance, and, and you can see the, you know, the severity of that impact. And I'll, I'll, I'll continue to warn you, uh, you as I show some videos which really are quite hard to, um, to watch. Now, um, this is a video that I show my engineering class saying, and we, it's actually quite common that we see this scenario having to do with failure to lock the brakes of the wheelchair, and I say to my engineering class, you know, we've got to be able to develop better uh, wheelchairs that have self-locking brakes, and I know those systems exist. You know what's going to happen. Here we go, yeah. So that's, I think, a largely preventable fall. Now, this is another example of um, a fall during incorrect um, weight shifting. Um, and, I, and I show it um, just to sort of indicate, and so many of you are familiar with this, but look at the challenge faced by this woman, and, and it makes me think about the environment. You look at these chairs, which are extremely heavy, difficult to move, and the challenge that this woman has in moving her uh, walker close enough to that chair in order to um, successfully transfer. And I'll, I'll just um, try to pause it here. So she's moving over, but look at you know, issues of base of support, where her feet are, where she needs to go, and the fact that she's holding on to two things that really are unstable, that both of them are, are moving objects. And down she goes. With regard to tripping, um, be, having the foot caught on equipment was the most common. Nearly as common was the foot being caught on level ground, and I'll, later I'll show you an example of that. Here's an example where a foot gets caught on equipment. This woman, she seems to recognize that there is, um, I'll, I'll play that again, you know, this equipment, she goes to move around it, but doesn't quite get all the way around and trips on the leg of that equipment, which, which really should not, of course, be in the hallway. Mobility aids. Um, about 60% of residents in the two facilities are habitual users of mobility aids, but you see that collectively only 30% of falls occur while using a mobility aid. And often we see in cases like this, incorrect use of mobility aids, which of course is, is often second, secondary to, to dementia. But look how she's, this woman is using a mobility aid not surprising, the wheel gets caught here, sending her you know, off. Um, so again, you think about the design of mobility aids, that, that something you know, needs to be improved there, that, that it should be impossible, in a sense, to use the mobility aid in that uh, incorrect way. Walking collectively was the most common activity, but it was really closely followed by two things, standing um, and, um, and sitting down. So um, yeah, 18% of falls during forward walking. Here's an, like, I'm gonna show these videos, and, and I show these and mention that they're examples really of sort of do not intervene falls, especially this second one. But let's look here. This is a man uh, who's, who's you know, in long-term care. His wife has visited with the dog. Uh, he is spending time with the dog, walking the dog. And we've heard, you know, there are a couple studies showing that dogs, that animals can increase risk. In this case, that's exactly what happens here. He tries to make an attempt to get around uh, the dog, which stops for a minute, and he's unable to recover a stable gait, and he goes down. Now, this one especially, I think, is a, a sort of do not intervene. This man, who seems to be doing you know, fantastic, is playing with uh, this ball, doing exercise, social activity, and this is an example of, of walking and walking sideways, and what you really see is that was a trip where um, his, his foot, uh, the, the toe of, of one foot hits the heel of, of the other foot and, and sends him uh, falling. As I mentioned, standing, standing and weight shifting, 11% of falls. And let's look at, at this example where a woman attempts to initiate a turn, moves the walker, but is unable to really move the feet, whether that's uh, I think that woman may have a diagnosis of Parkinson's, so perhaps that's related to uh, Parkinson's type freezing. This is an example of, of falling while reaching 
And we see that collectively 6% of falls from standing involves some sort of reaching, whether you're reaching down and then getting up, reaching up. This is a case where a woman reaches down um, and you might, you know, you'd almost say, well, is that a fall? I think it is. She, she comes to rest unintentionally on the ground. And I'm actually proud of the way in which she's able to avoid injury there. And I'll show that one again when we talk about head injury. Now, we, probably many of you noticed the, that the New York Times recently ran a series of articles um, related to falls. And um, they highlighted this issue right here, which we see is very common. It's very relevant to, to, to what we see in the facilities, long-term care facilities we're working with, that um, there's a dilemma about do you allow residents to uh, have their walkers uh, right next to the dining room, or, or the, like the table that they're sitting at? Because if, if you allowed every, all of them to have walkers, then you know, it becomes a, tr a tripping hazard, a fall hazard in itself. But, um, you know, they highlight this sort of dilemma. And um, the next video, it's relevant to this issue, but I think what I want to, you know, the t t t sort of mention here is, is the dilemma that the individual care aide or, you know, individual who is working with this older adult faces in, you know, the trade-off between promoting independence, promoting social interaction between this woman and other residents at the facility, and trying to prevent falls. So let's just play it once, and then I'll, I'll play it again. So this woman has just gotten up from uh, after eating lunch. She is unsure, does she want to you know, start with her walker and move away, or does she want to you know, continue to hang around? But watch what the care aid is doing. So now you know what happens. Let's look more carefully. And really how attentive, and I think, you know, that this care aid is doing, in my opinion, exactly what she should be doing. Uh, she's nearby. She's trying to, you know, strike that balance between presenting the mobility aid, allowing the woman to be independent, So very difficult to prevent a fall like that and a very challenging situation. Now, how close, uh, one thing that we've been wondering about recently is how well do the results from our video analysis, sorry, our video analysis match the results that you get from incident reports? And we structured the incident reports. We worked with um, the uh, facilities so that the responses to the questions of like, you know, cause of imbalance, activity at the, at the time of the fall, use of mobility aids, that these were identical in our video analysis questionnaire and in the incident report. And not surprisingly, we see that, well, perhaps it is surprising, but less than 50% agreement between the responses on the two for cause of imbalance, activity at the time of the fall, uh, b quite a bit better, 80% agreement for mobility aids. Did it matter whether or not the fall was witnessed or not? 64% were unwitnessed, um, and 36% were, were witnessed. It only mattered with regard to cause of imbalance, which was a little bit better in the witnessed falls. Um, activity at time of fall and mobility aids, there was no significant difference whether the fall was witnessed or not. So. Um, challenging. Now, where were the sources of disagreement? Again, slipping. If we look over here, we saw out of 334 falls, based on video analysis, only two falls were due to slipping, but 49 falls on, based on the incident report were recorded as due, due to slipping. But even some of the other categories, you see like um, here are reports of 159 falls due to incorrect weight shifting, only 92%, sorry, 92 of them matched. Many of them, you know, were due to other causes based on, um, sorry, over here, based on video analysis. What about activity at the time of the fall? The biggest mismatch I think we see here is that um, based on video analysis, falls during sitting down, while sitting down, are more common than falls while rising. 61 versus 43, so about 1.5 times more common. 
whereas the incident reports say that um, getting up while rising is three times more common as an activity associated with falls than, um, than sitting down. So that's a, a fairly large mismatch. Here you see mobility aids um, where, um, and, and you see you know, that there are some mismatches whereas when, when there's a report of no mobility, no, let's say here, a report of a wheelchair in use, a lot of times we see it's not. A report of walker in use, a lot of times we see that there's no walker being used. Now, let's go on to talk about impact sites. And what we see is that 30% of falls overall involve impact to the head. So it's, it's a very alarming statistic and sort of in line with what we saw earlier with regard to you know, this rapid increase. So um, we also see that 43% of falls involve hip impact and uh, nearly 70% involve hand or, or forearm impact. But what I want to do is sort of give you an idea, sort of this conceptual model uh, in a sense of, of what we're seeing with regard to the descent and impact stage of the fall. And it all starts, I think, with the direction of the fall and the fact that there's a lot of change in direction, that, that if a fall starts out in a certain direction, it doesn't necessarily end up in that direction. If you fall backwards, that's the exception. You're likely to land backwards. So what I'm showing here is initial fall direction on the horizontal and landing configuration on the vertical. So overall, 39% of falls were initially backward. And if you started backward, you tended to land backward, right? But look at what happens with sideways and forwards. If you, fall si if you initially fall sideways, about a third of the time, you end up landing backwards. Much more often, you'll, you'll rotate to land backwards than forwards. If you fall forwards, about a third of the time, you'll land sideways. So there's this tendency towards backward rotation, much more common than forward rotation. So what's going on with that? Well, I think it all has to do with head impact. And it's an the example that I use is like, imagine what would happen if your hands were, you fell forward and your hands were stuck in your, in, in your pockets. I mean, it's, it's really kind of painful to even imagine. But the question is, would you impact your head? Well, certainly your risk would be way higher. But there is something that you can do to avoid head impact, and that's to rotate. So if you sort of imagine that you've lost the effectiveness of your upper limbs in order to arrest the fall, what alternatives would you develop? And I think this is one of the, you know, the more novel observations from the study that, that uh, we're seeing. So it has some implications. Um, we see that hip impact is just as likely in falls because of this rotation. Here you see that you know, the odds ratio for um, hip impact was no, not significantly different between sideways and forward falls both of those were higher than backward or straight down. And again, here you see this incidence of hip impact and forward and sideways much higher than the others. Here's an example. I mentioned we've, we've captured about six falls on video involving hip fracture. Here's an example. And this is an example where you will see that rotation, that initially the fall direction is forward while walking. It's an example of a trip where she, um, she trips on level ground. We don't know if it has to do with foot drop, uh, but you'll see it's a very curious case in terms of the cause of the fall. But what I want you to focus on here is um, how severe the impact to the hip is and how so much of the energy of the fall is delivered right to the hip and not surprising that a hip fracture occurred. She's attempting to grasp. Here's another angle of that same fall. And you really see how so much of the energy is delivered right to the hip. Now, head impact, it, it associated with fall direction that it was more likely to occur in forward falls. In fact, you see that 59% of forward falls involved head impact, more common than in um, any other fall direction. And interestingly, kind of sadly, Impact to the outstretched hand did not affect your ris the risk for head impact. 
Again, it was very common, 70% of falls overall, we saw hand impact, but it didn't have an effect on risk for head impact. We've looked at some clinical risk factors. Um, as I mentioned, we have 108 fallers, you know, who have agreed to provide us with medical records. We see hypertension increases risk for head impact, perhaps due to antihypertensives that increase risk for, you know, sort of dizziness or, um, and a fall that's likely to involve head impact. Impaired vision, which may have to do with the ability to, to, to you know, perceive the environment and coordinate the responses. Female gender, increased risk, 2.5-fold increased risk for head impact, uh, maybe having to do with arm strength. So now here's a montage of, of, of several videos related to the issue of head impact. So we'll start, um, it starts with showing some videos where uh, there's an attempt to rest with the arms, but it's unsuccessful. And these are hard to watch. There's especially some backward falls that show very severe um, head impacts. All right, so these ones, very difficult to watch. And this, this one where the woman seems to be startled by this, you know, the sudden appearance, recognition of, of an obstacle in her way, falls backward and impacts her head. Now, here's some more cheerful videos to look at. There's still falls, but no head, head impact. And these individuals doing a fantastic job in arresting the fall with the outstretched hands, often rotating to, here again is that fall that we saw, does a great job in... Now here's the other thing, we saw those backward falls where there's a lack of trunk and neck control and that sort of whip-like motion. Here's some examples where there is sufficient strength and control to prevent that sort of thing. So trying to put this together, um, I say here's a hypothesis, the cause of head injuries during falls in older adults. So, so I think, first of all, there needs, of course, to be a recognition that you're falling in order for protective responses to emerge. So if someone is lacking all you know, sensory function and unable to detect that they're falling, of course, they're going to be more likely to impact their head. I think it's also we see an importance of awareness of the environment. Maybe that's where vision comes in. A and so somewhere, you know, there's a need to like select, ability to select and coordinate the landing response. So that has to do with sort of initiation and drawing on um, a motor strategy that's appropriate. Then there's these issues that have to do with execution. Like, do you have the neuromuscular capacities uh, or really the, the musculoskeletal capacities that are essential for success? So arm strength, ability to rotate the trunk, trunk and, and neck um, muscle control. And then finally, you know, I think these things sort of lead to like what's the, what are the accelerations of the head? Of course, that will also depend on, on the floor, on, the, on local shock absorbers. We've seen that in other studies that you know, soft tissue stiffness of older adults is decreased by about threefold, so it's less able to absorb energy, whether we're talking about the scalp or, or the trochanteric tissues over the hip. And then brain injury thresholds, which of course are, can be influenced by things like anticoagulants. So what can we do? Well, I think exercise, of course, is, is essential. I would push that exercise needs to move beyond just preventing falls to think about preventing injuries in the event of a fall. So some of these core you know, musculoskeletal things that I mentioned, upper limb strength, trunk and neck uh, strength. And, and thinking, of course, that you know, the notion here isn't that you introduce this at age 82 once you're in long-term care, but rather much earlier that people need to think about, if I fall, am I able to avoid head impact at you know, a very early age, relatively early age. The other thing that we are very keen on and doing research on is compliant flooring. We've worked with a certain type of floor uh, manufactured by a company in the States, have found that um, for in simulated head impacts, it reduces peak forces to the head by 68%. 
reduces uh, forces to the hip by about 35%, which is, doesn't sound like much, but it's actually better than most, the vast majority of hip protectors. And it doesn't impair, you know, mobility and balance. Of course, you know, th here's a design dilemma because you can, of course, go to like a, you know, a 30 centimeter thick gym mat, you're going to reduce the risk for injury, but you're going to have people losing balance and falling on it. So um, this particular flooring, I think, you know, it seems to do a pretty good job at, at balancing those two things. So we're in the middle of a clinical trial, actually in one of the long-term care facilities that uh, are partners in, in the video collection where we have um, randomly allocated compliant flooring to 100 in a, within 150 rooms. So 75 will receive flooring, seven, uh, the compliant flooring, 75 will get like a sham floor. It's a big dilemma, like how can we really blind this study? And there's a, you know, that's one of the issues. Um, I was talking to Stephen yesterday, he was encouraging me to talk about real life issues related to this study, which is ongoing. Um, the other thing that we have found related to flooring is there can be ergonomic issues, not surprisingly. Um, and um, in particular, moving heavy equipment, the push-pull forces for staff in moving things like um, sit-to-stand lifts. Even with wheelchairs, you'll feel a difference. And so we're doing some ergonomic studies on that right now. With regard to the, the, the sit-to-stand lift, we purchased a motorized lift from a company in um, the Netherlands that has gone far towards solving the problem. Uh, of course, the staff want more than one lift and they're not cheap. Um, but um, I know there are other groups that are looking at flooring. Um, th this is um, perhaps the most extensive you know, RCT that's really been done. Um, there was certainly that we're aware of that um, in another three years, we'll know does it reduce injuries associated with falls, injuries that occur, of course, in the bedroom, because that's where the, uh, the flooring has changed. So finally, just to acknowledge the many um, collaborators, um, really a, a, a main partner in this research is um, Dr. Fabio Feldman, who um, is a manager for falls prevention at Fraser Health Authority and, and is crucial in, in sort of allowing for these partnerships to have formed, but uh, many others who have contributed um, in a, in a major way to the research. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll, you'll agree that that's fascinating work and you know, really advancing the field in terms of um, prevention of falls in these groups. So thank you very much. Um, I've just um, We have a gift for you. And um, I'd just like to explain the gift to you and to everybody else. Um, so for this, in, on behalf of the speakers, we've given um, a donation to an organisation in Uganda um, called The Age Family. Um, and it works directly with older people and particularly supporting older people who are um, having grandchildren that they care for. Um, and the, the money will be used to buy some cows, which um, assist the older people apparently in transport of the grandchildren, um, but also some income in terms of um, selling the milk for um, costs that they incur. Um, and so there's also a mug in, um, with the logo of the organisation. So, yes, thank you very much for your talk. We're most grateful.